come cease your striving, only believe. You know what that means, right? That we don't work our way to heaven. If that's what you're trying, you're, you, you're not going to be good enough. You're not going to do enough. God's a perfect being, and unless you're perfect, you can't make it through works, so you have to believe in Christ who did the work for you. That's the gospel of Jesus Christ, and it's good news. Well, today is St. Patrick's Day, although I don't see too much green out there, so it must not be that big of a holiday. Most folks honestly don't know too much about Patrick. They just focus on wearing the green or the shamrocks or drinking green beer or uh, celebrating the luck of the Irish. So here's a primer on Patrick. St. Patrick was not actually Irish. (laughs) And he was never chosen as a saint by the Roman Catholic Church. Patrick wasn't even his original name. There are many medieval legends that surround his life. Most of them are unverified. We do know that he was raised in Roman Britannica, Great Britain, likely near the Scottish town of Dumbarton. His father was a church deacon. His grandfather was an elder. But Patrick did not embrace Christianity as a young man. He wrote later that God just wasn't important to him. And some of you may relate, you've come to church with your parents and God is not yet important to you. Well, that's what Patrick was like. At age 16, approximately, these dates are debated, 405 AD, his homeland of Britain was raided and he was abducted, he was thrown on a slave ship and he was carried away to an Irish pagan overlord. In his own written work that's been preserved called The Confession, he recounts his time of slavery while in Ireland. He spent six years tending his master's sheep on the slopes of a mountain range there. During that time, he testified that he became drastically humbled. He viewed his captivity as the chastening hand of God for him ignoring God. He came during that time to fully embrace Christ as Savior and to worship God the Father. He began to practice a daily fervent practice of prayer. He said sometimes he believed he prayed over a hundred times a day. Eventually, he was led by God through some providential dreams that came to him out of captivity, and he made his way to a ship and then back to Britain. There, back in Britain, he studied for the ministry. He grew in his faith a number of years. It was somewhere around the age of 40 that he sensed a call upon his life to come back to Ireland and to bring the gospel to an island that was entrenched in paganism, and he was well aware of it. It was a dark island. It was drenched in the worship of nature, of earth and sky and water. It was steeped in the pagan arts, including magic. The island was dominated by a number of violent and warring tribes. They competed for dominance. Patrick knew the Irish clan system well, and he decided by faith to focus on converting the chieftains who would then influence the entire clan. Though he was not the first to bring the gospel to Ireland, none had such a spiritual impact on that island as Patrick. But he did not have it easy. Over the next roughly 30 years of ministry, it is said that he baptized over 100,000 on that island, started over 300 churches and monasteries, and literally drove paganism out of Ireland. He also launched missionary endeavors to other locations. One legend says that Patrick drove the snakes out of Ireland. That's not physically true. It's not literally true, but it was spiritually true. He drove the snake, that is, the devil and his hordes, out of Ireland and all their beliefs along with it. His life and his work illustrates what a humble man, using the quiet but powerful, mighty hand of God can do to dispel all of the powers of magic and all the powers of paganism simply by living a godly life and speaking the gospel. 
The power of God often works in quiet ways, not flashy ways, but it is much stronger than all the flash of magic that this world has to offer. The New International Dictionary of the Christian Church summarizes Patrick's influence this way. There is no doubt that he broke the power of heathenism in Ireland and that his teaching was scriptural and evangelical and that the church which he founded was independent of Rome. Powerful man, powerful example. Unfortunately, and sadly, though our land was privileged to possess the light of the gospel for centuries, we are now seeing a return to darkness, a resurgence of interest in witches, paganism, magic, sorcery, and you name it. Of course, in one sense, this is not surprising since the New Testament warns that in the end times, Satan's supernatural activity will increase. However, God's power is greater than that of the pagans, and he has proven it again and again throughout human history. All you need to do is look outside and be reminded God made that. Don't worship that. Worship the God who made that, right? He is the artiste. He is the sculptor. He is the potter over the clay. He deserves the credit. To give credit to the creation doesn't even make any sense. Pagans worship what God created. Those who are enlightened worship the God who did the creating. Yet magic has a long history of influencing darkened societies. And there are many hints at the influence of pagan magic, both in the societies of the Old Testament that surrounded Israel, and yes, also in the New Testament as the gospel began to move out from Jerusalem and encounter these heathen societies with the gospel of Christ, a conflict between the power of God and the power of paganism. Dr. Yamuchi An archaeologist writes this, it is clear from the scriptures themselves, from extra biblical texts, and from archaeological discoveries that the word of God came to Jews and Christians who lived in a world which was steeped with occult beliefs and practices. The biblical revelation did not come to sinless humans, but reached them in their cultural situations. And their cultural situations were largely religious and largely filled with magic. We will see this influence in our scripture text today as we return to the book of Acts, chapter 8, and verses 5 through 24. If you turn in your Bibles there, book of Acts, chapter 8, starting with verse 5. And I'll just read from verse 4, but we kind of covered that last time we were in Acts. From verse 4 of Acts 8. Therefore, those who had been scattered went about preaching the word. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and began proclaiming Christ to them. The crowds, with one accord, were giving attention to what was said by Philip as they heard and saw the signs which he was performing. For in the case of many who had unclean spirits, they were coming out of them shouting with a loud voice. And many who had been paralyzed and lame were healed. So there was much rejoicing in that city. Now, there was a man named Simon who formerly was practicing magic in the city and astonishing the people of Samaria, claiming to be someone great. And they all, from smallest to greatest, were giving attention to him saying, this man is what is called the great power of God. And they were giving him attention because he had for a long time astonished them with his magic arts. But when they believed Philip preaching the good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were being baptized, men and women alike. Even Simon himself believed and after being baptized, he continued on with Philip And as he observed signs and great miracles taking place, he was constantly amazed. Now, when the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent them Peter and John, 
who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For he had not yet fallen upon any of them. They had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they began laying their hands on them, and they were receiving the Holy Spirit. Now, when Simon saw that the Spirit was bestowed through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money, saying, Give this authority to me as well, so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, May your silver perish with you, because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money? You have no part or portion in this matter, for your heart is not right before God. Therefore, repent of this wickedness of yours and pray the Lord that, if possible, the intention of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are in the gall of bitterness and in the bondage of iniquity. But Simon answered and said, Pray to the Lord for me yourselves, so that nothing of what you have said may come upon me. Fascinating passage. And a passage which brings together the movement of the gospel and the power of God and what was entrenched in that area, the power of magic, and gets you to compare the two. That's what you should at least get from this passage, if nothing else. Really, it tells us God's power is greater. You knew that. God's power is unstoppable. I hope you knew that. It tells us that there is power in false religion. Those who worship nature, though, cannot compete with the power of the God who made nature. Now, we learn the supremacy of God's power from four angles, and we're not going to get to all four of these today. The first angle is that that God's power is proclaimed. We'll call that the proclamation of God's power. That's largely in verses 5 through 8. And then, secondly, we see the imitation of God's power in verses 9 through 11. Third, we see the superiority of God's power in verses 12 through 19. And last, we see the wrongful seeking of God's power on the part of Simon in verses 20 through 24. So we start with the proclamation of God's power in verses 5 through 8. Let's reread that little section. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and began proclaiming Christ to them. The crowds with one accord were giving attention to what was said by Philip as they heard and saw the signs which he was performing. For in the case of many who had unclean spirits, they were coming out of them, shouting with a loud voice, and many who had been paralyzed and lame were healed. So there was much rejoicing in that city. So this is the proclamation of the gospel along with the signs that back it up in verse Uh, five and following. Now, you know, the writer of the book of Acts, that's Luke, at this point in the narrative, he he wants to bring and continue to advance the story of of the spread of the church. He wants to do it by focusing on this man, Philip. Philip becomes important for the spreading of the gospel, and I hope you'll see why. We've already been introduced to this Philip before, though only briefly, In the book of Acts, he was one of the seven proto-deacons, the seven that were chosen in Acts chapter 6. The apostles laid their hands on them, remember that, and chose them to uh, care for the Greek-speaking widows who were being overlooked in the serving of food. They were chosen because of their character. They were chosen because of their wisdom. They were also chosen because of their ministry skill and leadership. The apostles put trust in them, and those seven worked administratively as leaders to keep the unity in that church between the Hebrew Jews and the Greek-speaking Jews to make sure everything was being done uh, in a way that would be loving and just and even-handed in the church. And they were successful in that. Um, the, The text indicates that they were successful because the gospel continued to spread throughout Jerusalem. Like Stephen, we can see that there was more to this man, Philip, than first met the eye. There was more to him than being an administrator. Being an administrator is a great thing, but in his case, there was more to him. He was a man who was full of the Holy Spirit. He was a man who was an exemplary Christian leader. Honestly, I think Philip is one of those New Testament personages who is understudied 
You hear about a lot of people in the New Testament and you do character studies on them and you hear messages on Peter and Paul and John and, you know, John the Baptist and all of that. But what about this Philip? What an amazing guy he is. It's really a shame. There's so much to learn from this man. Firstly, he was a man of great courage. Do you see that? There was persecution that was already going on. That's the reason they were moving into Samaria in the first place, right? Persecution broke out. Heavy, widespread persecution in Jerusalem. His friend Stephen had just been stoned to death outside the walls of Jerusalem. And here he is devoting himself to spread the very message that got his friend killed. The gospel of Jesus Christ. He was not only a man of courage, but out in the open he was bold. And he took initiative. He was standing there alone, as far as we know, and proclaiming Christ to an entire new region where the gospel had not penetrated yet. He was breaking the ice, so to say, in this region, this Roman province of Samaria. He also was a man who was concerned for lost souls. He didn't want people uh, coming to him only. He wanted to go out to people that were lost. He wanted to go out to find where the gospel had not penetrated yet, and he wanted to make sure they had a chance to hear it. He took the initiative. He took the gospel out to other people. What an example he is. Philip was not a homebody. He didn't just hang around believers all the time. He was an adventurer. He was a man's man. He was unabashed. He was unafraid. He was a true leader. Listen, we could use more men like this today. Indeed, I think that Luke presents Philip at this point in the narrative not only to document the spread of the gospel out from Jerusalem to Samaria, as Jesus predicted would happen in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, but to present Philip as a positive Christian example. Why? To spur us on, to spur the reader on. Be bold in your evangelism. See how God can take a normal guy and can use him. You know, later in Acts chapter 21 and verse 8, it will say that Philip is going to be called the evangelist. What a nice name, right? How would you like to be called the evangelist? That's Philip. By the way, that distinguishes this Philip from another Philip who was one of the 12, right? The apostle Philip. This is not the apostle Philip. This is Philip, one of the seven. He is the evangelist. So he was a deacon, evangelist, leader. And I say again, may God give us more of these kind of men who are not afraid, who understand the priority of the gospel. Indeed, I would ask, where are our adventurous men today? We have so many men here at Hope Bible Church, so many men members that are here. How many of you men are underachieving, spiritually speaking? You're overloading your, yourself with pursuit of career and estate and you don't have time. All the time has been crowded out and you're underachieving when it comes to spiritual matters. How many of you are dallying with games and porn and wasting your time on entertainment and you're not making yourself available for the kind of rigorous training and study and discipleship it'll take to have a leader like this? Where are the men willing to organize, willing to lead, willing to pay the price, willing to pray, willing to work with a team of other men, willing to agonize for the progress of the gospel, willing to put themselves out on the line, not sitting around waiting for somebody to come to them, but taking an initiative and seeing a need. There is so much that doesn't get done in churches because men sit on their hands and think they're doing enough. Why don't you step up? Why don't you volunteer? Why don't you believe that God can do more with you? Do you think there was something special about the way Philip was born and brought into this world? Are you not teachable? Do you want your gifts buried and then explain to the Lord Jesus why you only used 15 or 20% of what had been given to you? Our deacons and elders need help. Ministry leaders need more faithful workers and leaders. They're new ministries to meet new needs that need to be started. Why do you hold back? Look at an example like Philip and say, there's more I can be doing. There's more I should be doing. Get up. Get going. Take the initiative like Philip. 
In Acts, we see Philip's evangelism used to launch the gospel into a new area, really new areas. His work of evangelism, in a sense, forced the church, and remember, the whole universal church was basically right there in Jerusalem, so the universal church was equivalent with the local church at that time. It forced that church out of its purely Jerusalem, Judean, Jewish box and forced them to begin to get on the move and take it out to new regions. You also can be a catalyst to ministry. You could be used to improve our men's ministry. You could be used to improve our youth ministry. Our missions ministry could develop more. Our our, uh, local evangelism needs a lot of help. Christian ed ministries have been asking for help. Love to see a Spanish-speaking Bible study. I dream about these things. I've prayed about a Roman Catholic evangelism outreach. I've prayed for that for two decades, and we're still waiting for the man to arise to do that. Yes, I'm talking about you, not somebody else, not the guy two rows in front of you, not the guy three rows in the back. I'm talking about you, how God can use you. And you're not, you're not doubting you when you don't step up. You're doubting God using you. And that's not right. Notice Philip's initiative in the latter part of the verse there. It says he went to the city of Samaria. Persecution, he said, I'm not going to let that slow me down. I'm not going to let that stop me. I'm going somewhere and I'm preaching Christ. And that's what he did. He went to Samaria. Yes, there was a severe persecution, you may remember, in response to Saul. He's going door to door. He's dragging Christians off. He's locking up men and women. And that drove thousands of these Christians out of Jerusalem into other areas. We talked about the surprising effect of persecution was evangelism and lots of evangelism. And it wasn't just the apostles. It wasn't just the seven. All the Christians were out doing evangelism. Philip decided, I'm not going to go into hiding. He took the gospel to a new region. He said, if they've had plenty of opportunity to hear it in Jerusalem, we've been there preaching for a few years now. They rejected it. The leaders spurned it. Now they're attacking the church. That's fine. They're not worthy of it. We'll take it somewhere else. That's what we're going to do. And I love that. I love that about him, that initiative. It just, it just makes you want to just get out there and do something for the Lord, right? So he went to the city of Samaria. Now, the scholars debate which city this was. There were four or five prominent cities in the region of Samaria in those days, and different scholars argue for which city it was. They give their pros and cons. Luke does not specify beyond what he wrote, so dogmatism on this is not in order Uh, nor is it really necessary to understand what was happening here. We do know the city was in the region of Samaria. That means it was to the north of Jerusalem. It says he went down to Samaria, but that actually means north. And the reason for that is that, you know, Jerusalem is in a mountainous region. And so when he says down to Samaria, he means literally down out of the Judean highlands and up to the north. So they went down in elevation, but they went up north. Now, we also know this was a significant step for Philip and for the entire church because up till now, the church was not focused on bearing witness about Jesus Christ to the Samaritans. This was not their focus up to this point in time. It really wasn't even the focus of the ministry of Jesus when he was on earth. In fact, Jesus said as much in Matthew 15, 24, Jesus' words, he said, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And that's why Jesus didn't really spend much time among the Samaritans. We know about his encounter with the woman by the well, right? The Samaritan woman by the well. We know that. He went there, he evangelized her, and then he evangelized the whole town that was there. But it really wasn't the focus of his ministry. The focus of his ministry was the Jews. Samaritans were not Jews. You need to understand that to understand the progress of what's happening here. Samaritans were not Jews. What's more, they were not even loved by the Jews. In fact, quite the opposite. We think we have prejudice in America. Some regions of the world, prejudice is so incredibly strong. There was a strong, distasteful animosity between Jews and Samaritans. It was hostile during New Testament times. Why? Why and what was the source? Well... The feud had a long history, long before the New Testament. 
Do you know this feud started way, way back in the Old Testament when the 10 northern tribes, 10 of the 12 northern tribes, the tribes of Israel broke away from the house of David who was ruling in Jerusalem in the south and they formed their own kingdom. You remember this, right? What was the name of that kingdom? Israel. They were to the north. So the southern kingdom was called Judah because Judah was the dominant tribe in the south. That is from whence the name Jew comes from. They are from the tribe of Judah. The northern kingdom was called Israel, and they decided to have their own place of worship and their own system of worship away from Solomon's temple. In other words, they set up a rival system of worship because they were fed up with the way Rehoboam, David's descendant, had treated them. Much of Israel's history covers this time of the divided kingdom. You can read about it in 1 Kings chapter 12 and following. Through the many, many decades, that northern kingdom of Israel drifted further and further from the law of God. They ended up in full-blown idol worship under Ahab and Jezebel. In the days of Elijah and then Elisha after him, they were calling the Israelites back from that idol worship that they had fallen into to worship the true God. But eventually their sin just kept piling up and it was so great that God had to use a foreign nation, the nation of Assyria, to rip the Israelites off of their land and take them off into captivity and spread them among the nations. You can read about that in 2 Kings chapter 18 and verses 9 through 12. It gives all the details there. There were only a few of the poor Israelites who were allowed to remain in the land or kind of came back to the land. And through the years, these Israelites intermarried with the pagan Canaanites, and they produced a half-Israelite and half-Gentile nation to the north of the Jews in the south. Of course, Judah had their own trouble. They also dallied in idolatry and later went over into full-blown idolatry. And so God chose another nation, Babylon, about 130 years later to take them off of the land as well. And that was for their sins. But they returned to the land in mass. They believed themselves the pure Israelites, the Jews in the south. So they had a disdain for their northern half-breeds who had not remained faithful to Moses in their eyes and to the prophets. And so this animosity between north and south continued even after the deportation time and even into the intertestamental time. In fact, um, some want to know why the parable of the Good Samaritan was so shocking and startling to people. It's because it was very, very difficult for the Jews to hear about a Good Samaritan, a half-breed doing a better job than the pure religious people to the south who looked at a man that was beaten and bleeding and decided to walk by him and not help. And here was this good Samaritan that took time and money to care for him. And Jesus said, there's the example of someone who's really responding to the love of God. That was very hard for the Jews to listen to that. In fact, Jesus did that on purpose. Jesus was not an easy person to listen to. He was constantly challenging the people and their prejudices. I mentioned during the intertestamental time, that's the time between the Old Testament and the New Testament, the Samaritans were never really reconciled with their southern brethren. They continued to worship at a different place, Mount Gerizim, not Jerusalem. So by the time we come to New Testament times, as the Romans had conquered all the land, they had different provinces. The province to the south was Judea. The province to the north was Samaria, and actually even north of that was Galilee. So you almost had to go through Samaria to get to Galilee, and Jews hated the Samaritans so much they would go around Samaria to get to Galilee when they were traveling. And that's how much disdain there was. When Jesus spoke with a Samaritan woman by the well, and he led her to salvation, she was amazed at Jesus Christ. And, and she said, I per- I, sir, I perceive you to be a prophet. And she went on to talk about how their people worshiped at this mountain. We know that you Jews worship in that mountain. And Jesus said, he said this, you worship what you do not know. We worship what we know for salvation is from the Jews. He put her in her place. He said, you need to understand that in a formal sense, it's not the Jews who moved away from God. It's you Samaritans that committed apostasy. 
But then he went on to say, a time is coming and now is when the true worshipers will not worship here or there, but they'll worship God in spirit and in truth. He also said there, one of the clearest proclamations he made to a Samaritan woman to bless her, and remember, she was no moral lady, but he said to her, because she was anticipating the Messiah coming, he said, I who speak to you am the Messiah. And then he went on to demonstrate that um, with his ability to read her heart. Well, the crowds were impressed with the gospel about Jesus Christ and his kingdom. Jesus had gone there before. He had spoken a little bit of the gospel to them, but Jesus at that point obviously had not been crucified, had not been buried, had not been risen. And so now the crowds were really hearing for the first time the fullness of this gospel, right? By the way, I want to make this point also that sometimes we get so focused on evangelizing the groups that we wish would get saved. Now, here the church was, was rightly witnessing to the Jews first. That was God's design. It was their privilege to hear of their kingdom first. It was right for them to do that. But they were so focused on that, they hadn't yet broken out of there to witness to other people that might be more responsive to the gospel. Are you following what I'm saying? Sometimes we may inadvertently do the same thing. We have groups of people, we want them to respond, and we've prayed for them for years, and we've witnessed to them, that's good, do that. But we're neglecting others that might respond more. Like who? Search for them. Find them. There may be some groups. Maybe they're internationals. Maybe they're young people. Maybe they're not the ones that you would naturally gravitate towards. But if they're responding to the gospel, shouldn't they get your attention? I think they should. Who would be our Samaritans, so to say? Who are we overlooking? There may be someone close at hand that we're neglecting. Well, I think... That must have gotten into Philip's mind, and he went down down there, and he started preaching. This Philip guy, like I said, he he was not just an administrator. He must have been a powerful speaker, full of the Spirit, deeply moved to speak with passion about his Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It says the crowds were riveted on his message. It says they were transfixed. That shows that as he was preaching this gospel, the Spirit of God was working in the crowds. God was sovereignly determined to spread salvation there, and God was using the initiative and faith and boldness of Philip to accomplish this. Listen, quality preaching and, by extension, good Bible teaching is always interesting. It is always passionate. It always must be applicable to the people you're speaking to. It should always have that extra dimension that you're not just imparting some facts, but you're speaking to hearts. You're speaking to souls. You're preaching or teaching for life change. When you have the opportunity, don't just casually impart information. The the message that you are speaking about is the most important message. You have to believe that. You have to know that. You have to be convinced of that. You have to realize that you cannot exaggerate the importance of this message. It doesn't matter if you shout a little bit about it. It's that important. This gospel saves souls for eternity. There is no other message that does that. Listen, they get excited on Oprah all the time for the things they talk about. That's impotent, right? Politicians get all excited about the next great thing that's going to happen that changes nothing anyways, right? This changes things. This is something to get excited about. It's not enough to speak truth accurately. If you realize what you're talking about and what what is going to be the fallout if people believe or don't believe, you have to speak it with passion. What message is more important than this? All of you, you prepare your lessons for the children. You prepare your lessons to speak to the women, to the teens, to adult classes, to your small group? Do you throw it together last minute? Is that how you treat the people in front of you? Is that how you treat the word of God? Should you not prepare well? Do you not understand that getting the notes ready is the easy part? Getting your heart ready is the hard part? Every time we open the Bible and preach from it, we're hypocrites. Who can, who can keep all this stuff? Who can believe all of this? Who can practice all of this? It takes more time to work on your heart to get ready to teach and preach. Philip had done that already. He'd done the hard work of discipleship. He'd sacrificed already. Now the Spirit of God was pleased to use him because his life meant it. You're a teacher. That's a privilege. Don't take that for granted. I was even thinking about that when my voice was gone for a 
couple of months there of struggling was like, God, now I can't even talk. You know, what did I do wrong? What was my sin? You probe yourself a lot during times like that. And uh, he gave me my voice back, I think. And I just don't take it for granted. I have a voice. I can speak again. Praise God for that, you know? When you speak, make it cogent, make it clear, make it organized, all of that, yes, but make it compelling. Make it reach the person. Who are you speaking to? What do they need to hear? If the message has no relevance, if it's not compelling, people will turn you off. And rightly so. If they can't tell that you believe it, why should they waste their time? Philip's preaching, I believe, had, had all these elements that you want to have. Truth, passion, relevance, spiritual vigor. I think that there was a hush while he spoke. You know, in those days, people had to get pretty quiet because they didn't have microphones and all of that. So they'd get quiet and you could speak to thousands outside. They'd learn to do that. And there was a hush that came over the crowd and they honed in and they listened carefully. They got their kids quiet, you know? And they're like, this is new. This is something I haven't heard. What is this? What is he preaching about? And it was important to them. But we have to say it was more than the words that got their attention. Would you agree? Isn't that what the text says? The power of God also accompanied the gospel preached. Philip performed real miracles. Now, for those of you who doubt miracles, here is an eyewitness account of many miracles occurring in abundance, recorded in the very lifetime in which those events happened. These supernatural events were seen by hundreds, and they were recorded by a first-rate historian who wrote in the first century the very time it was happening. This is not mythology. This is not the gullible ancients believing anything that happens to come into town. This is strong eyewitness evidence that miracles are not only possible, but have actually taken place on this planet, have been seen, and have been documented. Doubting miracles runs contrary to evidence provided, and therefore doubting miracles is not wise. It's irrationally skeptical. A skeptic is not smarter than a believer if the evidence says you should believe. We have already seen Luke document his research well in this book, and he will continue to do so. So these were bona fide first century miracles that he's writing about. They're not tricks. They're not illusions. He's not, they're they're not, he's not embellishing all of this to try to make it sound, you know, all great. He just simply said, and he cast out spirits that came out with a loud voice. He healed the lame. You know, if you were writing this and you were trying to create something, you'd be adding in all of these details to embellish it. He just said, this is what they did. This is what happened. You can't fake the lame being healed the paralyzed getting up and walking. These are not illusions. They're great illusionists today, but none of them can, can, can do this with masses of people without a stage, without everything being set up ahead of time. Now, we must add that this is the first time we hear of a non-apostle performing miraculous signs for the people. How is it that Philip was able to do these miracles if he was not an apostle? One thing that the text makes clear is that Philip was only able to do these miracles after, listen, after the apostles had laid their hands on Stephen, Philip, and the others. Only after he had been publicly recognized to carry on and support the work of the apostles as their delegate do we read of him performing these miracles. Never before that laying on of hands did Philip perform miracles. And that should not be missed, or you will misinterpret what miracles mean and who is allowed to do and perform miracles. I've made this point before that contrary to the claims of the charismatic churches today, the early church, that is the church in the book of Acts, was not a miracle performing church. It was not a miracle performing church. They had miracle performing apostles 
who were hand-chosen by Jesus and were specifically empowered to show and demonstrate the miraculous powers that will be present when the Jewish kingdom comes in all of its fullness. Those miracles were small foretastes of the power that will be demonstrated in the millennial kingdom. That's why they were given an abundance to the Jews and those around the Jews, so they would get a taste of millennial kingdom power. This is what the Jews were promised in their scriptures. And Jesus was saying, I'm the king. Here's a demonstration of my power over nature. Here's a demonstration of my ability to remove diseases. And so he hand chose his delegates, his ambassadors, and they carried his message and they performed those same miracles as well. Now the apostles have laid hands on some and now we see an example of them carrying on and extending that same witnessing power. They are apostolic delegates. Because of the empowerment by the apostles, the people of Samaria now were getting a taste of what the Jews got to see, a plethora of Jesus' miracles. That's why the Jews were held so guilty, is they saw so many miracles, the only way they could explain it is to say, this must be the power of Satan. And Jesus rebuked them with, well, I guess then Satan is casting out Satan, his kingdom won't last too long, will it? The irony in that. The Samaritans had not seen these miracles. Now they were getting a chance to see them. Now the gospel was being proclaimed and they were getting an opportunity to be eyewitnesses of things that just can't happen. Supernatural events. It was breaking out all over Samaria. There were new eyes beholding the miracles. And the miracles included both kinds, the spiritual and the physical, right? There was power over the unclean spirits. And the proof of that was the voices of those that had been been captivated by the evil spirits. It says when they were cast out, the spirits didn't want to leave. And they were screaming with an angry, loud voice, not wanting to depart. But there was power by these apostolic delegates to command the evil spirits to leave. And they didn't want to. They wanted to resist. But they were subject to the power of God. But not just that, there were also those with physical diseases, every kind. There are two that are specified, the two hardest to heal, the lame and the paralyzed, right? You know, you go to these Benny Hen things, you know, or you see them and and he goes and he touches everyone and they fall back and you're like, "What what a ruse, you know? What kind of junk is that? Well, I perceive that someone has a stomach ache in the fourth row and now by the power of Jesus, be healed. And then someone out there starts feeling, I think I feel better. I think I feel better. I think I'm healed. That guy must have the power of healing. That's all just manipulation. That is not what they were dealing with. They were seeing real miracles and their eyes were bugging out. That's just not possible. They hadn't seen anything like this. By the way, this was extending the very ministry of Jesus. This is exactly what Jesus went around in Galilee to the north of Samaria doing. It says in Matthew 4, 23, Jesus was going through all of Galilee, town by town, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, the good news of the arrival of the kingdom, and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness among the people. You have it, you bring it, it doesn't matter. You don't need drugs. You don't need to go home and the symptoms will go away in five days. You'll be healed on the spot and you will be healed permanently. That's the real power of God. As with Jesus' display, this too, by Philip, was the power of God. This was not a sleight of hand trick. This is not the slow healing, the pretended healing, the staged healing. This was instant. This was unexplainable. All symptoms immediately removed. Every kind of disease. You know, you don't just select a few out of the audience that you can maybe manipulate the situation to show that they're here. No, you bring them up. I don't know what you're bringing up, but they'll leave healed. That's real power of God. And it was seen by hundreds, if not thousands. Science cannot explain these. This is the kind that demonstrates the finger of God is at work. Some people think that supernatural is just God doing something with nature that human beings haven't figured out yet to do, but with more science and technology, eventually we'll figure out how to do it. That might be true in some cases. God can manipulate nature, change it, move it in any direction, speed up the laws, slow them down, suspend them. He can do anything like that that he wants to with nature. But I don't think that men are ever going to learn to raise the dead. That's just me but I don't think they're going to do that. 
I think the giving of life, the creating of life, and the returning to life is the power and privilege of God alone. And that science and technology will never discover. In all these miracles, it is clear it was the finger of God stirring. The doctors could not do that. The witch doctors could not do that. Magic could not do that. You know, modern people, and you learn this in school, and so we have to re-educate you in church, have a disdain for the ancients. They think in an evolutionary box that everyone that was old was less evolved than we are today and we're so much smarter than the ancients. No, you are not. Your IQ is no better than theirs. You haven't evolved one whit. Don't take that personally. I speak of myself too. We just have more discoveries that we're standing on the shoulders of men who discovered things before us. That's all. It gives this mirage that because we have more technology, we're smarter. These were not naive people. These were not people that just would believe a trick. They wanted to see, wait, which card did you have up your sleeve? They would want to walk back around the magician and say, what's going on here? They would check things out just the same as we would. To assume that they didn't is just prejudice. It's disgusting, really. Those people had common sense. They used it. When they saw the signs of casting out demons and healing the sick, they responded exactly the way we would if we were there. What? This is amazing. I mean, people today, when there's a fantastic illusionist and they look like they're floating something on the stage, people are bugging out and they're trying to figure out how is that happening? You see them wince in their face, their eyes go like this and they're scrunching and you would want to figure it out. They couldn't figure it out. It was the power of God. The use of widespread phony miracles by many charlatans in our church age today must not be read into the true documented account of miracles such as here. Today's so-called miracles fall woefully short of this example and that of the apostles' miracles. When churches and so-called ministers try to foist phony miracles in front of others to give credence to the gospel, it backfires. It dissuades people from responding to the gospel because it looks like to get people to believe in Jesus, they have to promote phony miracles. The modern day so-called miracles are exaggerations and sleight of hand tricks and the power of persuasion, not the true outpouring of the power of God as seen in the book of Acts. It is not exercising greater faith to believe in false miracles. It is merely a lack of discernment to believe in that. What is a true working of God and what is not? What is magical and from Satan and what is from God? That is what we are supposed to be able to discern. But I don't want to overreact to the counterfeit. And run all the way to the other side and say, well, God doesn't do anything miraculous or supernatural in our age anymore. Uh, As far as I know, God still retains all of his power. Would you agree? I don't think the Almighty has lost any of his potency. Yes, God can still do miracles. And yes, God still does miracles. He does them today in response to the petitions of his people in prayer. Sometimes he does miracles. Sometimes he does not. It's the norm for him not to do miracles. It's the norm for him to do the miracle of providence, which means he works through natural means. He works through natural choices of people. He works through natural events, and he controls those events to bring about the answers to our prayers, to bring about the opportunities to spread the gospel. He normally works that way. Sometimes... Based upon his sovereignty, he may choose to go beyond that and startle a group of people and wake them up to his power. Particularly, we would expect God to do that in extra special situations where there's an immediate display of his power that is needed. Maybe in an area where the gospel has not yet penetrated and the people have been dominated by another religion and dominated by the paganism of their land. And just to demonstrate to those people the power that comes along with the gospel is greater than what you have already believed, he will do a miracle. He will do a supernatural event to get them to realize, wow, this is not just a man talking. God can do miracles today. 
not through a man gifted as the apostles were. For remember, the revelation that's come in the New Testament has been fully given and all the writers of Scripture have written and we have the full revelation of Jesus Christ. But it can come through prayer to awaken people to the power of God so they will give heed to the message that is preached. And I just want to mention, just in closing, the response to God's power in verse 8. Notice what it was. They were rejoicing. Do you see that? I like that. Please don't miss that. Persecution led to spreading evangelism and evangelism led to people's faith and repentance in Samaria. And what did that lead to? That led to great rejoicing. Some are saying, were they just rejoicing because people were getting healed or were they rejoicing because they got saved? How about both? How about both? Evangelism and salvation bring joy to those who believe. Are you a believer? Do you have the joy that Pastor Rodney talked about last week? Do you have joy in the Lord? It is only those who refuse to believe who never experience the power of God in their life. It's only those who say, I'm I'm not going to respond. I'm not going to give God control of my life. I'm not going to believe in Jesus who never have that joy. They never sense the power of God. But those who believe have joy. Who is it that said, God is a killjoy? Oh, I remember who it was. It was Satan. Do you believe that guy? Jesus called him a liar and the father of what? Lies. Remember, people, there is more joy in the gospel and in the Holy Spirit than all the wine and beer bottles in the world. Than all the video games in the world. You just might not be experiencing joy because you're indulging yourself and not learning the joy of the Holy Spirit. You are trading something greater for something far less because of your lack of faith. I don't know why people are pushing for the right to smoke marijuana today. We don't need it. We have the Holy Spirit of God and his joy is much more cogent and much more lasting and powerful. There is more of a party going on in the lives of the saved, blood-bought, headed-to-heaven saints than the blind, worldly ones below, thinking they have the good life and they don't even have life yet. Life is in Jesus and joy is found in Jesus. And it comes from believing the gospel. Jesus is the king of all the earth He died on the cross to pay for every last one of your sins, if you will believe. He rose bodily from the dead as our choir sung. If you embrace him now, you will have his joy in your life. And then when you die, the prophets say, fullness of joy is in his presence. Joy now, greater joy then, you can't lose. Jesus is our joy. Father in heaven, thank you for a little bit of a reminder of your power. And we pray as we go through this section and we see more about the impotency of magic and we see how it moves people away from a love of you that we will fall more in love with you and realize you didn't hold any good thing back from us. You have promised us every good thing. There are unimaginable places that we are going to go in the future. There are unimaginable sights we are going to see and experiences we are going to feel. And you have asked us as your children to serve you in humility now and suffer if need be as we await the fullness of that joy in the future. Thank you for the taste of that joy in the Holy Spirit who abides with us now. And thank you for Jesus, our Lord and Savior. We have prayed, Lord, and we pray that this preaching today will touch our hearts and change us and make us believe in, trust in, and follow after your power even more. In Jesus' name, amen.